Hello everybody, my name is Christian Poe and I'm Alex Howard and today we are going to talk about an open source exploration of a semantic structure for climate accounting. So let us start with introduction. The work that we've been doing here, uh, we've, we've been doing in the context of the Hyperledger Climate Action and Accounting Special Interest Group and specifically of the Standards Working Group of which I'm the chair. Um, my name is Christian Poe. I work for the NOVA Institute. We are, uh, are an independent, not-for-profit company in Southern Africa. We um, work to promote the quality of life of low-income households in Southern Africa. A lot of the work I've been doing relates to energy and air pollution in low-income communities in South Africa. And since 2006, we have been active in the voluntary carbon market in developing projects and implementing them to generate voluntary emission reductions uh, for sale to finance these projects. Um, in the context of the working group, my interest is specifically to, to work to find those deep ontological structures that will enable us to build a global impact accounting framework. About me, I have been working with Christian for the greatest part of seven years now. Uh, for most of it, I've actually been working alongside him at NOVA Institute, but nowadays I am an independent software developer. And it is in that capacity that I continue to be involved in the Hyperledger Climate Action and Counting Special Interest Group and specifically the Standards Working Group. Um, yeah, that's me. We just want to acknowledge our collaborators that worked with us on this presentation. Carl Robinson from Brer Tech Consulting in Canada and Alfonso Guvela from Mexico uh, from the Hyperledger Latino America chapter. So in terms of the challenge that we are facing, I don't have to really give you a lot of detail. I think all of you are painfully aware of the challenge of climate change. But here's just to set the context, just two, two graphs, um, both from Wikipedia in the spirit of open information. The, the, the one on the left shows uh, temperature changes in the last 50 years. And you can see that, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, those changes have been uh, dramatic. Um, but also over the continent of Africa, Asia, uh, and Europe, there, there have been substantial uh, uh, changes in temperature. And those changes you can see on the, in the graph on the, on the right correspond to humanly induced climate forces. So as a global community, we have to avoid catastrophic climate change. And that means we must dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase carbon sinks. And for this to be, to be even doable, to be even on the cards, climate accounting must be become ubiquitous. We must, we must get a grip on who emits what and for what reason and who is responsible for what and what can be done to avoid that. So you cannot manage what you do not know and you know by accounting for, for the processes that you are in control. But there's a problem. There are in fact many different ways in which climate accounting takes place. There are many pr different practices. There are different protocols. There are different standards and they are used for different purposes. And if we want to, to unite and manage the planet as a planet, the, these instances must at least be interoperable. Now, let's just think about what interoperability means. It means to be able to use information between different devices, systems, and frameworks. 
And there's in fact a hierarchy of interoperability in the context that we are working now. And the first one is just description. And to describe something in a way that it can be understood within another framework or in another context or in another jurisdiction, you require stable terminology. Uh, another level in the, in the hierarchy of interoperability is, is comparison. To compare two things, you need to express them in the same terms. So you need a stable terminology to start with. And for comparison, you need now to express that which one to compare in the same terminology. And aggregation is even further up the hierarchy. It means you must express not only in the same terminology, but in the same metric. And then you can aggregate whether that is is, is summing or, 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 or whatever the case may be. So these things are difficult. Uh, when you think of the global climate accounting um, space, description and together with description goes discovery, because if you can describe something, you know what to look for. The description and discovery is difficult because people don't use the same words to mean the same thing. So there's a lack of a, of a stable terminology. People use words like the environment, climate neutral, carbon neutral, but they don't always denote the same thing when they use those. People also are guided by different interests when they are speaking about impact. There are, there are people that are in a situation where they want to Play, downplay the impact or exaggerate the impact. Um, if we are going to move to a system, a global system where, where there are machine readable claims about environmental impact, that cannot be done without a shared language, let's say, uh, because it will either just compound the confusion that there currently is by aggregating things that do not belong together or, or comparing things that, that are really not the same, or it will fragment into, uh, into uh, just a large variety of in, incomparable uh, systems. And then no one can have a grip on the, on the global situation. So that is just about description. So comparing is difficult. In this in the circumstances because you have to there are differences in what is accounted for and how accounting takes place when you think about what is accounted for there are differences in in boundaries for example in organizational boundaries or in activity boundaries or even in the greenhouse gases that accounting takes place for and even when those things are the same even if you account for the same organizational boundaries, the same activity boundaries, the same greenhouse, greenhouse agents, there are different calculation methods. And those things are not always made explicit. Uh, just a brief example um, from, from my field of work, uh, so that, that um, to highlight this problem, even things that look the same are not the same. If you compare two Two projects that can be labeled in the same way. I, 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 I show them on the screen there. There's a, there's a voluntary carbon market, a voluntary carbon standard project, VCS 2505. Its, uh, its title is Fuel Efficient Cooking in South Africa. And there's a, another project in the gold standard, GS 4536, Brickstar Woodstove Maslava area. I'm involved in that one. So if you just look at them, they, all, they, are, they can be labeled the same. They are voluntary carbon market projects with improved cookstoves in South Africa. But they differ quite significantly. The one encompasses the whole country and the one just a specific region. The one estimates the baseline from, in, to my mind, in the EVE calculation using generic country level data. And the other one is based on empirical observations and household surveys in the area of application. And they have different methodologies, which 
derive more or less from the same context, but they are not exactly the same. And it is actually very difficult to take two things like this and to understand what that result, that resulting VER, voluntary emission reduction, what that actually means. And this takes, this takes place across, across the field of, of climate accounts. And it really follows that when, when description and comparison is difficult, then, then that aggregation is also problematic. Because you need for aggregation, the stable terminology, expression in the same terms, in the same metrics, and then with the same assumptions, things like emission factors or accounting theory. And when you don't have that, you have this, this, this concept of blurring and semantic zoom out. In other words, if you, if you have two, if you compare two periods, but they're not exactly the same period, or you don't know if they're exactly the same period, you can say, you can say over the past year, over the year 2019, you can say over the period preceding 2020 or in the recent past, and you become even all the more imprecise to the point where, like they said, Woody Allen, when he said uh, he read speed, speed read War and Peace in 20 minutes, he said it was about Russia. Um, so what do we do about this? Maybe you say, okay, maybe we must standardize these. Things. Let's standardize everything and then everything will be right. That's a, that's a very strong idea. And a lot of people have, have, have pursued that and they were right in doing so. But let's just think what, what, are, what are standards in fact, we are from the standards working group. So let's just think what, what standards are and is this the solution? So standards aggregate norms that help shape interest, constrain behavior, prescribe action and support a logic of pro appropriateness and consequences. And so what are norms? Norms are social constructs that emerge from persuasion, cascade through acceptance and internalize compliant behavior. So it stabilizes people's behavior. Uh, it, it, it standards make things happen in the same way. So that's that constrained behavior, prescribed action. And it lets consequences follow from compliance and non-compliance of those standards. So maybe this will help. And there are, in fact, a lot of standards in the field of climate accounting. This is not exhaustive, but this is just a, an example of a few that's out there and that, that we've looked at. And they vary quite a bit. Um, there, is, there are standards for specific jurisdictions, like the, from in, the US, in the US or Canada, that's here on the screen. There are standards driven by business, the business community for investors. The standards have different aims. And let's just look at a few examples of, of those aims, and then you'll, you'll understand the diversity and, in a certain sense, the problem of it. So, so some of the standards work from the perspective of the investor, like the ISSB. The ISSB aims to provide investors information about sustainability-related risks and opportunities. So it's focused on the investor, it's focused on risk and the opportunity. In other words, the investor as an invest, investor looking at a company or some investment, and it helps that person understand the sustainability related risk components of that, of that uh, decision. And this shapes the way in which that standard functions. If you think about, there's another perspective, there's a regulatory perspective. Uh, there are compliance to international treaties and, and, and that cascades down in regulation in individual countries, like, like the Paris Agreement. Um, then the, there are frame, uh, standards for voluntary climate action. The most well-known is the Gold Standard Foundation and uh, VERA, the, the VCS. And they represent 
or I would say two different views on, on, on voluntary climate action, the gold standard, a broader view, in other words, embedding that in what it calls environmental integrity and sustainable development. And, and the VC is much more focused. Um, and those are, those are both, it can be argued, le legitimate ways of, of, of proceeding. And then you, you, you can also have a project focus or you can have an institutional focus. And this is something like the, the, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. The Greenhouse Gas Protocol has a corporate accounting standard and a project protocol. And the corporate accounting standard is for businesses or for, for corporate entities for their business as usual. And the project standard is for those things that you do extra in order to benefit the environment. So that's, that is, that is a project. It's not your business as usual. That's something. And there are different things that come into play when you take each one of these perspectives. So standards have different interests, but standards also use different metrics. You can, you can use a performance metric or there are standards focusing on, a, on emission reductions or emission avoidance. And then there's, there is a focus on net emissions. So the difference between those is a performance standard is about efficiency. And that is the acknowledgement that there are sometimes more than one goal and that for the efficient allocation of resources, you have to balance those. Goals. And that's why, why efficiency is, is an important goal. And that's a legitimate way of looking at the problem. In emission avoidance compares what happened against what would have happened. So a counterfactual basis. And that aims to create a situation better than it would have been. And then net emissions is something, is, is something different as well. That just balances really emissions and sinks. And so I want to sink more than I imagine. Without reference to what would have happened. So emission avoidance, you can, you can still emit, have be a net emitter, but you, you can say, well, it's less than it would have been. Um, there's, a, there's a move towards net emissions as we proceed into the 21st, uh, 21st century. But the, there are different metrics, and it's, it's not so easy to compare things expressed in these different metrics. So is standardization uh, a solution? Well, yes and no. We cannot go back to these people and say, you know what, uh, me and some other people had a Zoom call the other day and we decided you should really standardize your things and then we can all work together. Because they all represent specific interest. They've developed these standards for a specific purpose. It serves a specific community. And it's not for us to say that it's not a legitimate thing. So it... There are different needs and there are different interests and there are different ways of looking at something. And it is to be prescriptive is inappropriate and it will not work anymore. So making just another standard or just trying to convince people that are well established in what they do to do something different for the sake of harmonizing standard is not going to be, is not going to be fun. So what must we do? Our suggestion is that we must find the conceptual bedrock on which these standards are built. And that we must make that explicit and create a way in which these standards can ex be expressed in terms, can be in terms of that conceptual bedrock, that underlying ontology. And that we can build from that ontology to, to, to show how these things interrelate and to, to build tools with which we can do comparisons and aggregation. And one of the examples that we've, we've been thinking about is the origin of HTML, of the World Wide Web. And that demonstrates the power of consensus on a profoundly simple opportunity generating enabling framework. 
So that's what we want to try to, to unearth. We want to say, it's not a standard. Let's find that ontology that lies underneath that. Let's make that, that explicit. And let's build on that. Tools with which we can take that which, which exists, which exists for a specific purpose and a legitimate need, and make that translatable through going back to the core concepts and, and make that interoperable in that, in that way. I give, hand over to Alex to show you what we've done, sir. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, before I start, I would just like to mention two things. Um, first of all, the ontology is a work in progress. It is by no means complete yet. Um, it is an open collaborative effort. So if at any point in time during this section of the presentation, you have questions or um, ideas or suggestions, please feel free to post it in the Q&A section and um, we'll try to get back to your comments uh, during the Q&A session. If we don't, we would very much love to engage with you afterwards via some other platform or means. The second thing I want to mention is that um, we'll be using the terms classes and axioms during this part of the presentation. Um, classes, by classes we mean representations of the things that reality is made up of from the perspective of impact accounting. And with axioms, we mean statements that define the relationships between those entities, between those classes. Right. The premise, the very basic statement that the entire ontology is built upon is that an agent engages in an activity that impacts an environment. In other words, somebody does something and it affects their surroundings. Now from this premise, we can see that the ontology must at least have the following three classes, one for agents, one for activities, and one for environments. And the axioms that go with them are, firstly, that an agent engages in an activity, and secondly, that an activity impacts an environment. This is obviously not enough. So now let's look at each of these three and ask what more do we need to add to the ontology to be able to understand and describe these entities better. We'll start with environments. When we are dealing with impact accounting, the things that we typically want to know about an environment is where is this environment? So what are its physical boundaries? When are we looking at this environment? Environments change all the time. So if we want to say something about an environment, we also have to say, at what point in time are we saying this about the environment or for which period in time do our statements apply to the environment? We also want to know other properties of the environment and their dimensions, like what is in the environment and what of them, um, which of them are of interest to us. So to capture these things in the ontology, we need a parameter class. These things are all parameters that we want to know about the environment. There are things that we can either measure or quantify or gauge in some way. The axiom that goes with the parameter class is that an environment is defined by parameters. We choose which aspects of an environment are important to us in our specific accounting scenario. And that choice of parameters define the environment of interest to us. But there's an important distinction between parameters and their values. While parameters remain fixed in terms of their definition, the values that they can take on change almost instantly from time to time, um, continuously, I mean. And these values that a parameter can take on is what we can call the state um, of the parameter or the state of the environment. So we need to also add the state class to our ontology and the axiom that a state is the value of a parameter p at time t. Uh, just a quick word here. Um, you will see that all these diagrams um, in this section of the presentation start with the owl 
thing class at the very top. This is because we are developing this ontology as a web ontology. And according to our, specific, our specification, the very top class of one's ontology must be the thing class. So all the classes that we've added up to now, agent, activity, environment, parameter, and state are all subclasses of the top class thing. Now that we've dealt with environment, what do we need to know further about activities? There are two things. Firstly, activities, the same activity, a specific activity, for example, traveling, can be performed in different ways. Um, and while well, most, most notably using different instruments or using different procedures. The activity of traveling, for example, can be conducted using a car or using a bicycle or using an airplane. And these different ways of performing an activity all have different impacts on the environment. To distinguish between them, we need to add two classes to the ontology. Firstly, that of instrument, and secondly, that of procedure. And the axioms that go with them is that a procedure guides an activity. It's like the recipe the steps that one follows, um, the set of actions that must be conducted to perform the activity. An instrument is, uh, well, an activity on the other hand is performed with an instrument. You always use something to do something. The second thing about activities that the ontology must capture is that activities have inputs and outputs. It is exactly via these inputs and outputs that the activities impact their environments. They take something from the environment and they change it or do something with it and then put it back into the environment, either in a different form or whatever. Now, to capture these inputs and outputs in our ontology, we do not need different classes. We can use the parameter class for that. But we do have to add at least two more axioms, namely the following. An activity has at least one input, an activity has at least one output. So on, in the diagram on the right, you can see we have instrument and it is linked to activity by the axiom that an activity is performed with an instrument and procedure is linked to activity by the axiom that the procedure guides an activity. An activity has parameters in forms of inputs and outputs. Lastly, what do we need to know more about agents? Well, up to now, we have already covered the relationship between agents and instruments, between agents and activities, and so forth. But we have not yet covered the fact that agents can enact different roles. Some of those roles in the world of impact accounting, well, the, some four of the most notable roles in the end of discipline of impact accounting is that of owner, operator, claimant, and auditor. So we add the role class to the ontology next to agent and all those other classes. And we say that an agent enacts a role. That is the first axiom that binds the role class to the agent class. Then we add owner, operator, claimant, and auditor as subclasses to the role class. And we can put down axioms for each of them. An owner owns a thing, literally anything. It can be a facility, it can be an instrument, it can be a company, whatever. An operator operates an instrument whether it be a measurement instrument, a transportation instrument, a production instrument, whatever. For the claimant and auditor, we add the axioms that a claimant, as a role, is an agent who makes a claim, and an auditor is an agent who audits a claim. But now you may ask, wait, where do claims fit into this ontology? That's a good question. If we look at our premise, an agent engages in activity that uh, impacts an environment, there is no mentioning of claims. But impact accounting is, as a discipline, 
deals at its very core with claims about agents, environments, activities, and their impacts. They make statements about things. So we can add the claim class to the ontology with the axiom that a claim is a statement about some specific thing. Literally anything that you state is a claim. If I say, my name is Alex, I am making a claim, and that claim can be verified in some way. And this brings us to the next question, possibly the most important. Where do standards fit into this ontology? Standards guide claims. You will remember that we said um, activities are guided by procedures, or procedure guides an activity. Now, a standard is, in a certain sense, a very special procedure. It's a specific type of procedure. And what it guides is the activity of making a claim about something. In the concept of impact accounting, that will be um, making a claim about one's carbon footprint or water footprint, or whatever that case may be. But standards do not only guide the procedure or the action of making claim, but also the structure of the claim itself. Um, so therefore, we add the standard class as a subclass to the procedure in our ontology, and we add the axiom that a standard guides a claim. Apart from the fact that in an, as a subclass of procedure, it also guides the action of making a claim. With this, we have reached, um, well, we have covered the full ontology um, as it stands at this point in time. We have 15 classes and 15 axioms that are all displayed on screen right now. And if we depict our ontology as a kind of knowledge graph, we get this diagram that you see on the right with thing as a top level in orange, the top level class in orange. Um, the yellow circles indicating the first level subclasses of the ontology and the green indicating the second level subclasses of the ontology and these um, bendy arrows indicating the axioms or the relationships between these classes. You may wonder what an implementation of the ontology may look like. Um, let me quickly show you a UML implementation. Well, okay, not a UML implementation, a protobuf implementation, but here is a UML diagram showing a possible implementation of the ontology um, in a protobuf based system. So you have the parameter class there and date and time and location as special types of parameters. And then you have, uh, well, in post above terms, a message for agents, a message for instrument, a message for environment, parameters, the, we already said parameters, but the values, which is um, constitute states, for which we have a message there. Um, then we have the activity message, and it all wraps up into an impact claim. Just as a brief note, um, as we have said, this ontology is still a work in progress, and there remains much to be done. One of the things that we hope to do soon is to embed our ontology in the ISO IAC basic formal ontology. And that will be quite a process, but um, there are a myriad of benefits of doing that, uh, most notably because the basic formal ontology is an ISO standard in itself, and it's been used by literally hundreds of endeavors and people on the internet. So if we can embed our ontology into the basic formal ontology and some of its extensions, um, we will be able to maximize or should be able to maximize its usefulness to the world of impact accounting. That's all for me. Thank you, Christian. So how do we envision that this ontology can be used? 
to solve the problems that we've been talking about? Well, the first problem we, we talked about was description. And we think that the ontology can help to clarify the meaning of terms. Um, and, the, and, the, and that in itself um, can, can bring some interoperability. We, we also see the possibility that we can create tools that function like the Rosetta Stone, where translation between standards are possible through going back to the core concepts and, and, and finding the points of comparison. And then we can have something that in this standard, the result would be this, and in, in another standard, the, the result from the same data would be something else. And that can actually help people to, to navigate between these differences. And then also through, through making explicit the assumptions and, and having some common basis on which to, to express them, we think we can also solve the problem of, of aggregation. So there's another aspect to this, and that is there are emerging standards like the IWs, IWA building standards actively. And we think our ontology can, can add some value to that. I have, a, I have a diagram here of an ecological, a ecological project and its properties from the IWA. And I want to draw your attention to the left, but on the left bottom, there's a, there's a property called a modular benefit project. And the idea is there that an ecological project can have sub projects that create specific benefits. For example, one can create an emission reduction. Another one can create an emission sink. It's even conceivable that that they may be in, in, in different domains. Now, that sounds fine, but if you apply the ontology and say an agent engages in activity that impacts an environment, you come to the realization that you should not call something a modular benefit project. You maybe, you should rather call it a, a, pod, a project benefit. In other words, the activity leads to an impact in an environment. Well, if you, if you think about it a little bit deeper, you shouldn't call it just a benefit because it can also be a negative impact. So you can say it's an it's a, a impact of the project. The project is the activity on, on, on an aggregate level on the, on the, on the individual level of the individual activity. Then what you, what you realize is that, well, you can go even deeper and more generic. You don't, it doesn't all have to apply only to an ecological project. Any activity, whether that is business as usual for your company, leads to impacts in environments. So you can use the same structure. You can, you can, you can use the ontology co to construct a generic structure that can be applied to project accounting like this, as well as corporate accounting using the same framework that can be used for climate accounting, but also for water impact, also for biodiversity impact, also for, for any other impact in any other environment. And in fact, when you have that generic frame based on the core realization that agents engage in activities that impact environment. You can build an accounting framework and tools that can be used across domains and that makes them worthwhile building. And that makes the, the impact that you can have through that process of standardization and the scope of those standards so much bigger. So what do we want to do next? Well, we want to expand the, the ontology to deeper levels. There are nuances to these things that we need to work out. We are aware of them. We have done some work in that regard, but there is quite a bit of expansion, expansion needed. We want to embed this into 
the basic formal ontology and its, its extensions. And that is um, that process we think will add a lot of value, but we are aware of that that, that is quite a bit of work. And then we want to develop tools to, to be able to use this. And to, for that, we invite you to join us, to participate, uh, to give us your, your feedback, your criticism, uh, your, 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 um, your suggestions. You can use the, the standards working group wiki. There is the address there, uh, as well as the Hyperledger uh, Climate Action Accounting mailing list. You can contact me at christian.po at nova.org.za. Um, these are the sources that we used, uh, the, the Interwork Alliance Voluntary Ecological Markets Overview document, as well as the Obo Foundry, the, the BFO diagram there. And now there's time for questions and comments. Thank you. <laughs>